Hello, everyone, and a Merry Christmas season to you and your loved ones. And uh, thanks for joining us at our next weekly edition of Surprises Worship Anywhere broadcast. Whether you're watching on TV or online, we're glad you're with us. Follow the text prompts to get involved, get connected, download our app. And before we do anything else, let's check in for charity. Every single check-in, every single month, and here's the visual uh, about this month's charity, does a ton of good. And we're not just uh, benefiting this charity ourselves. We are working with churches around the country, even around the world, so that every single check-in does amazing good. Thanks for your help checking in on Surprise Church Bismarck's Facebook page and doing good. We're in a new series called The Invitation. Check this out. All right, we are talking about the invitation that all of us have as creatures created by God, but who went astray from God. And instead of coming and destroying us, instead of coming and just starting over, <clears throat> God comes to us with an invitation. A little baby born long ago in a small backwoods town that would change the world completely. And that baby represents not just a story that we tell this time of year, but an invitation from God to be a part of what he's doing in this world. So Jesus uh, was God's response to our darkness. Throughout this series, we are going to be taking a look at some of the promises before Jesus was born that God made. I'm going to send someone to deal with this problem. And darkness was one of those problems. Now today, you might think of darkness as, as nice, like when the sun goes down, you like the stars and Christmas lights. But when scripture uses darkness, it's almost always in a very negative light. It, it's always, always, almost always a sense of um, something is broken, something is missing. And I think part of that is just living in the ancient world. When, when, when the sun goes down here, lights come on, right? Street lights, Christmas lights, yard lights. A lot of them come on automatically if there's motion sensors. If you ever drive out in the country, if you live, live in the city at night, you realize how dark it really is. And then try to drive without your headlights. Number one, you'll probably get arrested. Number two, you might end up hitting a deer or in the ditch. Now imagine living in ancient times where when the sun goes down, everybody just goes to bed because you can't see anything. There's no nightlight. There's no street light. There's no flashlight. Yeah, sure, you can light a fire, but and you can do a lantern, I suppose, but those are clunky, cumbersome things that, that were not easy and easy to do. They built, they built walls around cities back then because at night, wild animals and armies would come. And so night was a dangerous time. Darkness also, also represents brokenness. People who have their eyes open see the truth and see reality. People living in darkness tend to just be living a lie, living in blindness, living in a sense of being numb to the realities around them and just lost, literally lost, not able to find their way. So look at this promise that God made centuries before Jesus came. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2. Isaiah was a prophet. There's a book called Isaiah in the Old Testament of, of a man called by God to speak sometimes harsh words to his people, <clears throat> but interspersed amongst those challenging, confrontational words that he spoke to people that are living in darkness. You see these beautiful words of hope. Listen to this, Isaiah 9, 2. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, light has dawned. Really, this passage speaks to two different groups of people. People walking in darkness and people living in the land of deep darkness. Do you see the difference there? 
I mean, there, are, there is a sense in which we live in a direction. We might live <coughs> toward uh, a way that's not good, but maybe we just started or we haven't been doing it very long. We haven't kind of been totally enveloped by it. But there comes a point where, whether it's addiction or violent behavior or unhealthy patterns, they be, we, we walk in that darkness for so long that we become incapacitated by it. We stop functioning and we are now just living in that dark place. So I, I think this passage is talking to people who are on their way and who people who have arrived in the darkest of places where they're no longer able to function in a way that God wants them to. They're no longer able to love as he wants them to. They're no longer able to, to care as he wants them to. They're no, no, no longer able to pray and, and seek him as he wants them to. They're just lost living in darkness. <coughs> Excuse me. And on these people, it says light has dawned. These people thought maybe they were hopeless. Maybe they were not even in, in darkness of their own choosing. Maybe somebody had forced this darkness upon them by perverse abusive behavior, mistreatment, and injustice. That, that's another form of salvation, God, God coming to, people, to rescue people from that. But Jesus was promised here as a light that would rescue people who are walking the wrong way or who have been walking the wrong way so long that there really is no, heart, no hope unless light comes. And so Jesus, the baby Jesus, is actually a sort of invasion, if you want to look at it that way, where God has to enter in and, and just break the chains that we've built for ourselves. And you know the other thing about light? It sort of hurts at first, doesn't it? Have you ever, like I grew up on a farm where we had to pick rocks a lot, but if you've ever moved a brick in your backyard or a rock, you look up underneath it, what do you see? You see those creatures that like living in the dark, that don't like the light. And they're scurrying around like blinded by the light and they're freaking out, they're panicking, the millipedes, the ants, the beetles, the bugs, and they're just trying to scramble back into their holes. I think that's what light does to us at first that, that comes from God. Sometimes people are, try to avoid it. Oftentimes people feel like, they, I, I've known people throughout my time as a pastor who they go to church until something bad happens, and then they stop coming. They stop going to their community group. They'll stop being on their ministry team because they're living in darkness or they're walking towards the darkness and they don't want anybody around them to see that. They, they think they maybe have to fix themselves before they can come back into the light. They don't realize that light goes into the darkness, that you carry that darkness to the Lord and he will pour light into it, that God invades the darkness all the time just like he did in Jesus. And light hurts at first because when, when people see it, there's, there's emotions involved, there's humility involved, there's fear involved. What's going to happen? <clears throat> but when God gets in, amazing things happen. And it's possible to get adjusted to the dark where your eyes actually see better in the dark. But it's also true that when the light comes, at first it hurts. And then your eyes adjust and you're able to actually appreciate the colors, the textures, and everything around you that you can finally see. And I think that's why God was gentle in Jesus. I think he came gentle as a baby because he knows that at first, if he were to came, come like this powerful king, it's just too bright. I think it just scares people away. I think he came as a gentle baby and then a gentle man because he knows that light hurts at first. And people tend to avoid it. And you might have people in your life that are hostile to you or about your faith. And it's so important to remember, it's not about you. Light, light just hurts at first. If you're walking in darkness or dwelling in the land of deep darkness, you're there by your own choosing. And so if someone walks in with a flashlight, your first urge might be to a attack, fight, turn it off. Look at Isaiah go on here. <clears throat> Isaiah 9, 6, and 7. He goes on to say, for to us a child is born. Speaking in the present tense as if it's, he can almost see it happening. 
centuries before Jesus came. To us, a son is given. You might recognize this from Handel's Messiah. And the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor. These are the nicknames given to the Messiah, the, son, the one God would send to save the world. Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Wonderful Counselor, one who would advise a ruler on the way to go. Jesus is, is claims later to be the one sitting at God's right hand, like a good counselor would to a king, interceding on our behalf. Mighty God, so he himself then would also be God, not just the son of God, but he's also God, the everlasting father and prince of peace. I like how it doesn't say king of peace. A prince becomes the king when the king dies. It's like Jesus came as a prince, but he became king when he died. It says, of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. So that's the ultimate goal of this, peace. God wants people who are walking in deep darkness, living in deep darkness, to finally experience a peace maybe they don't even know. If you've ever gotten out of an abusive situation, you didn't even realize how much it hurt to live there, how unsettled, how anxious, how, tr how trying it was until you got out and you felt the load off your shoulders. You're like, I can breathe again. God wants you and I to live with that peace regardless of our circumstances. He didn't send Jesus here to empty out hospitals. He didn't send Jesus to prevent every problem from existing. He didn't magically turn every bullet into rubber so that no one could ever get hurt or shot. He didn't prevent us from doing poor things and hurtful things to each other or others to us. But he did come so that people living in the darkness have seen a great light and that they would live with the peace that has no end, regardless of circumstances. And when we accept God's invitation, in Jesus, his peace and his light shines in us. It actually goes with us. It's not just that, that we look up and, oh, there he is, there's Jesus. It, he lives in us. That peace goes with us and it affects everywhere we go, especially in dark places. This is true especially in dark places. <clears throat> I was uh, doing a little sea research, a little... Uh, oceanic uh, investigation this week about bioluminescence. It's always been something that's kind of fascinated me. The deep sea is fascinating. You know, there are more species that we have not discovered that exist on the bottom floors of the ocean than we, we, we even understand. Thousands of species we'll never even discover. And God, I think, just created them to be, it's like, because I'm God, I, I just love creating beauty and complexity. One of the things we have learned is that creatures down there, some of them don't need eyes to see. They've adjusted so much to the dark that they can just function without eyes. Other creatures create their own light. They can live in those dark places, but whether it's for communication, uh, like bioluminescence is, they're learning just more and more about the communication capacities that it ha they have, or uh, predators, or warding off pr predators or prey, uh, all kinds of, things we don't understand, but it's possible to live in the land of deep darkness, so deep that it would crush a man-made vehicle, except, except for like the most specialized, thick pressurized containers. But fish can live down there. Sea life can live down there and make their own light. I think that's a great image for the gospel. I think that's an image of, of the fact that we can live in places that are not easy. You can work or go to school and have moments that are difficult, have seasons that are trying, challenging, dark, and you can live in those times. It's not always gonna happen, but you can live with a peace that comes only from Jesus. That gives you a purpose too. And the purpose is, is this, flashlights? Like if someone gave you a flashlight and you live in a place where there's never darkness, uh, what's this for? <clears throat> right? I mean, what's the point of a flashlight if it's always bright? They're, they're useless during the daytime. Flashlights are useless unless it's dark. Unless it's nighttime. <clears throat> Excuse me, I've got a cold this week and it's just bugging me, but we'll get through this together. So 
one of the purposes we want to put in front of ourselves this month, like we do every year, is something called the Lighthouse Project, where we say, love your neighbors and change the world. This is the darkest month of the year. December 21st is the darkest day of the year. Sunsets at like 4.30. But what we're, what we're inviting people to do on Sunday, or if you're watching from a distance, message us, and we'll do this for you. We have a, we'll have a map of our area, and um, we'll, we're going to put a tack where we live. And we're going to say, hey, declare your house to be a lighthouse in your neighborhood. That you want to be bright when, when life gets dark for your neighbors. That you want to be just a, a source of hope and encouragement. So people are going to come forward, put their tack on that map, and then grab a little slip of paper that goes to our lighthouse page on our website. And um, it's going to say how you can do that. Here's some basic, simple steps. Starting with just walking your neighborhood and do prayer walks. Learning how to pray for your neighborhood simple way to bring light because we have purpose we have bioluminescence we have the ability we have light within us that god wants us to share that gives us a purpose here's here's another one <clears throat> you know three out of five people surveyed said that they would go to church if someone invited them three out of five that's 60 percent of people would go to church if god if someone invited them so look at this Here's our three Christmas gatherings, 22nd to the 24th. We're renting out the Bell Mayhus again this year. Fanciest, coolest place in town. Absolutely free to anyone who wants to come. 700 seat capacity at that theater. That means over three services, three gatherings, we have the capacity to fill 2,100 seats with people who get to savor and celebrate the birth of Jesus. 2,100 seats, if 60% of people accept an invitation, they're invited, that 2,100 seats is 6% of 3,500. So let's ask the question, what if 3,500 people were invited? Could we, could we reach 2,100 people for Christmas? What if 2,100 people, put it another way, what if 2,100 people learned to become bioluminescent by trusting Jesus in their darkness? Because we're not just looking for people to come to the Bell Mayhus just to say they did. We want to teach people how to glow. We want to be, teach people how to shine in dark places, to, to, to not just walk in darkness and dwell in darkness, but to walk out or to be in that darkness with light. Like Jesus said in John 8, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but have the light of life. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light, Isaiah said. Now Jesus comes, and when he grew up, he said, whoever follows me will never Walk in darkness. They'll be bioluminescent. Even in dark times, even in dark places, even in hard things, you're going to glow when Jesus lives in you. That means you're going to have a peace that you would not otherwise have. You're going to be able to make decisions you may not otherwise make. You're going to have problems and doubts and struggles for sure. You're never going to be perfect. In, in some ways, you're going to be more aware of your own struggles. But you're going to have light. And that light can give you peace. And that peace is infectious. We want thousands to experience that. So here's, you know, we might think, is that even possible? Like, is it possible for a church our size to, to reach thousands? Well, let's check this out. Here's what it could look like to invite 3,500 people. If three out of five of those would come, that's 2,100, right? So <clears throat> a couple of things you can do right now, actually, is share our Facebook event. On the top of our Facebook page, there's a Christmas at the Bell event. It looks just like that lower right-hand um, image. Just click share. And in addition to that, click on the event itself, go in and start inviting people that live nearby. Three out of five people will come, especially if they know and trust the person inviting them. They're gonna be amazed at the response. On Sundays, we're gonna have a Christmas station. If you're in the Bismarck area, we'd love to share these with you, um, where you can take a promo pick, something that gets people to our website. We're gonna have 5,000 cards, giving out a stack of five a week, but pe people can grab a stack more. I've grabbed, I grabbed a bunch more because I, I give one out everywhere I go. I got my hair cut. Here's an invite. Go to the grocery store. Thanks for checking me out. Hey, check this out. <laughs> a waiter. Here's a tip. Nice tip. Not a crappy tip. Um, somebody came to my house to fix something. Hey, thanks for coming. Check this out. I'm giving them away like candy. Here you go. There's like a really cool thing coming up. Benefit for charity. People, no one has once refused to take one. Some have been extremely grateful. So grab a stack of these if you're around. We'll also have thousands of flyers. Posters that can be put up all around town, wherever posters can be. Love your help getting the word out in those ways. 
<clears throat> we're also organizing a care team. Whether you're in Bismarck or far away, we'd love you to be on the care team if you're interested. They're going to be calling 800 people that we have contact information for and inviting them, number one, to share their prayer requests, to just wish them Merry Christmas, but also certainly to see if they have any questions about our Christmas schedule. We're doing a localized Christmas campaign where we're helping. We have a, a, a PDF we're sharing that features 24 local businesses that we want to encourage people to support, to buy local, invest in your local community. So businesses have noticed that. If people have noticed that and are sharing that, and gets that, that people go to our Christmas page to get that document, and they see the bell. And it's another way of just raising awareness. The Lighthouse Project will get you and I praying for our neighbors and our neighborhoods, and I think God's going to use that to open up conversations, make us more available. If we ask him to make us available, he's going to make us, uh, show us opportunities. Um, and then finally, we'll be doing media appearances and, and different things to get the word out on the, the, the larger scale. So can we, re can we invite 3,500 as a church if all of us work together? Absolutely. And so we'd love your help with that. Start by the Facebook event, but anytime there's other shareables we put up online, grab some of the physical things you can, you can grab. Make sure to, that everybody that trusts you in your life knows about it and is able to come. If you're at a distance, have a watch party. Have a watch party. We'll have a fantastic professionally uh, recorded video of the worship service uh, starting on uh, Christmas Eve. Have a watch party with people if you can't make it there physically, if you're at a distance. And we will definitely cast that wide net because here's the deal. The invitation of the baby in the manger, like we said, it's not just something that happened. It's something that happens. It's God's invitation to you in the dark places of your life to hold his hand. If he doesn't pull you out of those dark places today, it's going to be okay. If there's dark places that you have to walk through in the future, it's going to be okay because this invitation is for you to walk with him and for him to live in you, to shine in you. And the invitation is for them, your coworkers, your neighbors, your friends, your family, your acquaintances, people you come into contact with in your spheres of influence. You might be tempted to look past, but maybe this month, they get an invitation to, from someone that they know, someone like you, and it changes their lives, not just here and now, but for eternity. God has invited us. Let's join that glowing family of servant missionaries who share that invitation with others this month. Merry Christmas to you. Can't wait to watch what God's going to do. We'll see you soon. God bless.
to be 